Is it too early for everybody? Yes. It's like 11 30, right? We're all awake. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're excited to have you guys here and this amazing cast here on stage. Uh, we get to play for a living, so it's uh, get to spend an hour together kind of sharing what we do and uh, have a lot of fun. Um, we're going to go down and kind of talk about ourselves for a little bit, maybe a little narcissistic and kind of have fun showing off what we do. Uh, no, it's just we really love everything that we do every day, so it's kind of fun to share it with you guys and we appreciate you guys coming out and supporting us. Um, so we're going to maybe introduce ourselves first here. Should I go first? Should yes. I talk about me? Yeah. So you guys know why I'm talking to you guys? I got the microphone and I'm the loudest right now. Uh, so my name's Keith Aram. I'm the CEO of uh, PCB Productions here in Los Angeles. Uh, my wife Valerie here in the front row. Uh, this is PCB. Uh, we've been running this since our 24th year. Uh, we've done about 700 video games, uh, mainly performance direction, uh, Call of Duty, Spider-Man, Transformers, Titanfall. Ghost Recon, we've done a lot of games. Just a few. Uh, just a few. Yeah, just just a, a, you haven't off. heard of, you know, many of them, but just all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and over the years, we've got to work with these uh, amazing performers, and we're super excited to kind of talk Where? to you guys about... Uh, Where? Uh, <laughs> coming, Which coming. Okay, good. Where? Uh, but uh, I got in the industry, uh, I was originally on Capitol Records with Biohazard and Contagion, doing angry industrial music and doing the whole fun thing. Uh, we got into scoring for video games, and did games like Earthworm Jim back in the day, and Battletech and all these fun games. Uh, started doing sound effects for like Tony Hawk and other things, and, uh, and then got into directing. And my wife and I now have just been doing, focused on mainly performance direction. So we do voiceover, motion capture, facial capture, all the kind of performances you see in different video games. That's what we do every day. And so over the years, we've got to interact with like just amazing performers and get to see their talent, the range of what they do. And uh, as their careers have been growing, uh, the industry has been growing, and so now it's like $400 billion, and we were all working during COVID, so it was a crazy time for us, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, so, enough about me. So I want to I hear from you guys. Uh, so we'll start off with Nicole. Maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe how you got started in this crazy business. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Nicole. There's so many beautiful faces here. Oh, um, and I've always been passionate about stories of acting. I did a lot of musical theater as a, a wee one. I knew I wanted to act. I came out to Los Angeles to do film and TV, and I had actually no real awareness of how massive the video game industry from a performance perspective was, um, and just through a very fortunate series of events, kind of ended up auditioning for a big video game called Middle Earth Shadow of War. Oh my god! A Lord of the Rings game, um, and very young me at the time fell into, which is not everyone's story, everyone's story is very different, fell into getting to do the full performance capture with some really iconic names and some people that have done incredible work in so many games. And they really took me under their wing and I, I realized just how beautiful specifically this medium is from a performance perspective. And I hadn't been given that in the same way until I got on stage and realized like, these people are just as, if not more, passionate and excited about the way that these stories are being told. And I say it often, like you get on a motion capture set, you get into a wonderful booth at PCB, you are just around people that are just excited about the IP in a way that, that's not always the case in, in a film or a television, which I you know, still work on those projects and people are passionate, but games specifically, everyone who's there is someone who was sitting on a panel or was excited about games in the first place. Like they want to be there, they're nerds themselves. So I don't know, I love that and wow, there we go. And that is, um, yeah, I think kind of how I fell in. From there I was very much like, oh, this is an option. Yes, send me send me more auditions, I want to I want to do more voice work, I want to do more games, um, and I ended up in Resident Evil, and the rest is kind of history. That is awesome. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, too. And what's one of the things that's interesting that you mentioned about that is that this community uh, of fans supports us, but within the community, it's very much a very tight-knit community because it's very small. People think how big games are, but everyone knows each other and refers each other, and 
In other mediums, like film or television, it seems very competitive, but in video games and voiceover, you find that actors are often recommending other actors for parts. We've had a lot of actors come in reading for something or auditioning for something, and they're like, you know who would be perfect for this? And then they'll recommend a friend, and that's how actors introduce other actors, and that's how a lot of actors actually get started. Um, in this business, so it's a very supportive community. We do that all the time. Ma Maggie and I will absolutely, sorry, I'm bringing you into this, I know. Uh, uh, good morning. <laughs> we'll do that all the time. Like, you know, some role will be coming around, it's like, okay, but like, have you read for this? Like, you know, like, there's a lot of that kind of communication, and I think that, I don't know, it's just, it's such a friendship based collaboration, and it makes it, Helen's nodding in favor. Look at how happy. I have friends. Yeah. Yes, you do. I know about this. Yes, you do. your water bottle is. It's like you have a friend with you I on the stage. Right. Oh, this guy? Yeah, this yeah, is my guy. what's his name? Uh, this is Water Bottle. Very, very uh, original can name. Can we that later? It's the right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how did you get so, <laughs> so how, how did you get started, Kelly? Oh, Nate? Yeah. Uh, he, um, well, I got started in what was at the time an unconventional way. Um, I did musical theater at the time, that's not the unconventional thing. Um, <laughs> what was unconventional, I did um, animation on uh, Newgrounds and uh, YouTube when it was in its infancy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, yeah. see a couple of <laughs> Newgrounders out there. Um, and uh, we had this little tight knit community and we uh, that of just like these kids coming up in this new internet world. It's crazy how fast it's moved now. Um, but at the time, you know, there wasn't any like uh, casting call club or anything to get uh, voice actors online for indie stuff. So uh, we just used each other um, with with uh, with our you know, permission um, and. Uh, I, I would tend to, you know, be the one they come to a lot, and the more I did it, the more I'm like, I like this. Yeah, I, my dad will tell you I used to copy uh, Spongebob when it was on the TV. <laughs> um, so when I figured out uh, it was uh, something viable that I could do with my life, something you could get paid for, uh, I went for it. Um, I was the... Uh, uh, youngest uh, student in uh, Bob Bergen's class at the time, and he set me on the right path. And Bob's good people. Now, then I then I booked a role called Fun Time Freddy, and that sort of launched it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. All right, and Maggie, how did how did you get caught up in this crazy business? Uh, it was all an accident. No, just like that. Yeah. No, <laughs> what I love about doing panels like this is that you get to hear everybody's uh, origin stories, really. And everyone, as you can see, has a very different path into the industry. There's no one right way to do it. You have to find your path. Mine was, uh, I did not always want to be an actor. I kind of fought against the pull to be an actor for quite a long time because it wasn't realistic. Um, and I was, you know, I think as so many people are, there were a variety of directions that I could have gone. I'm a capable person, I could have chosen a variety of things, but ultimately this was the thing that continued to challenge me the most. It was the hardest, I felt like it was the hardest thing I could do with my life and with my career. The thing I didn't know I could succeed in, and that's what made it so exciting and so thrilling and worth pursuing for me. Uh, so I kept coming back, and eventually I decided that in order to elevate what I'm able to offer as an actor and move my career to the next level. I had to go back to grad school. So I went to, I got my MA in classical acting from Lambda and then, and then, uh, you know, I graduated in 2018 and then I moved to LA in January of 2019 and then I booked a little thing called Resident Evil Village a few months after I moved to LA. <laughs> quite a big blur. But it's an interesting moment because me going to grad school, that was me actively making the choice of, I'm not beating around the bush anymore, this is what I want to do with my life, I'm going to put all the other stuff to the side and I'm going to really invest my time and my energy into this and take a big risk. And I guess it, it worked out. So that's how my career in LA and in video games started and then similar to Nicole, I just fell in love with the community first of all and that's what made me want to keep going. It's really, it's a place of joy. Everyone's a fan. 
everyone's excited not just about the games that they're working on, but the games that everyone else is doing. So it's really exciting to work with people who feel like they are collaborators. It's also a unique thing about gaming in particular as well, is that it's it really is this Frankenstein process where there are so many people who get to have creative input into the creation of any one character or any one game. So it's this lovely exchange and artistic dialogue between all of these different factions of the industry, which I think is really cool. So. Well, that's what makes our industry so fun, right? Because this Frankensteining of performances, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of times you're going to have the voice, uh, you might have the motion capture, stunts, the facial expressions, all those are usually put together as different elements. A lot of times you'll see full performance capture where actors are wearing head cams, you've got all the mocap markers, we're also doing voiceover and everything that's there. But in the end, a lot of that has to be put together. If you see films like Avatar and other films that are made that way, it's very similar to what we're doing in video games, just on a much grander scale. Uh, but we do end up having to really uh, isolate each of those different parts. So you'll be able to, fortunately as an actor, you get to do some of these fun things. You get to do the full performance capture, but then we're also spending a lot of time in the studio because we have so much more content than movies and television shows. An average TV show might be about 300 lines of dialogue for a half hour TV show, and a full motion picture uh, might be about 1,500 lines of dialogue, maybe 2,000. How many lines do you think might be in Resident Evil? Yeah, about 30,000 lines of dialogue? A lot. Yeah, hours and hours and hours, and that's just like one person, and then you've got everyone else doing hours and hours because you've got all the different variations of dying, <laughs> we're doing, getting murdered. We're doing the Like a Dragon uh, uh, right now for the new Yakuza series, and that one's like 48,000 lines of dialogue. We're recording for about a year plus the mocap, plus the facial capture, so it's, uh, those are beasts, right? And so the performers have to do a tremendous amount of performance over a lot of time, so it's not always just what you see kind of in the making of. I know Val loves to talk about your time on uh, Saints Row, when you had like everybody in LA come through your booth and like do a million like, okay, now you're on fire, okay, now you're getting on <laughs> okay, now a shark's eating only your right toe. <laughs> Have a death sounds, I think, in video games are probably the best, uh, just because we have to come up with like creative ways to kill everybody. Um, so, actually, what would be probably the, the worst death you've ever done in a video game? Worst death. Um, well, some of these Japanese RPGs get very <laughs> creative, um, and you know, it, it, with a, a lot of um, it, dubbing stuff, we have to match it to picture. So. <laughs> There are certain uh, times, I, I think, I, I believe I was a demon dying for, it, it's like, okay, this is a 10 second yell, and then he get the, then he goes up, and then down and the back up, and then it, it, it was like a Shakespearean kind of like, um, vaudeville death. <laughs> well, I'm not going to ask you to do that, because I, I want to save your breath. However, uh, we are working on a, uh, an unnamed horror project right now, which we can't talk about, but Yes, we are working on something very cool right now. But and you, if you are, say so, and, and I won't say what it is. But can you give us a little preview of? Uh, so one of the things you, you guys may not know about Kellen, which is very cool, is that he has. What you tell me? This, a, right? demon. Wait, a, a demon. A, a demon inside him. Yes, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Besides that, the physical side. Do you have like a, a thing with your? Uh, yeah, um, I have a manipulable epiglottis. Epiglottis. Yeah. And so what he can do, so his normal voice is really cool. This is really, we're going to do this live because you will enjoy this. epiglottis? That it's a mouthful. Whatever a profile. profile you put out ever. Just, you should be reading <laughs> some <of> bio. <laughs> if, if, if I could say that in the beginning of my career, I'd get hired for Hi. something. Just the term. I have a manipulable epiglottis. Because a lot of actors get hired for I their voice. So we were doing, uh, I think, I think it was one of our classes. We were doing, it, we were doing uh, something together. And a lot of times, actors have to do multiple voices, right? It's not just the voice that you're cast of as you, but we're also doing things where we're having to do other creatures or other characters, that kind of stuff. And this guy pulls out this like six-year-old man voice. I'm like, what? Like, how did you do that? Six-year-old man. Six, Sixty. Oh, six. Six-year-old. Six 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 What's a six-year-old man? But then he starts doing these creature sounds, and I'm like, holy shit. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, is that what we're I was thinking, you know, can I swear? 
And uh, unbelievable. So, so without ripping yourself apart, can you just give us a little sample? Because Baker, who was here yesterday, I don't think he's here today. Uh, yeah, and uh, he was incognito. But D. Bradley Baker, if you guys don't know him, uh, he, he uh, years ago when we started doing uh, Spider-Man and Star Wars and other things, he'd come to me and said, I want to be uh, the next uh, Frank Welker. And Frank Welker was a voice actor who did every animal and every creature in every movie. He did everything from the lab and Aladdin and everything else. And he's just amazing. And that's what D got started on. And then um, this guy whips out this thing and, uh, not that thing, this thing. <laughs> when I'm drinking water? You want this to be the splash section? You know, <laughs> they got the cushy seats, they, they pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone will like, <laughs> I kind of think I'm that kind of thing. <laughs> because you want, you know, when you're doing creatures, you can't just take animal sounds and other sound effects. You actually need a vocalization. So if you can do one more, so you want one where like there's an alert, like there's a the player's there and the creature sees you, right? So it can't just be like just growling. It's got to be like, hey, he's over there, right? So <laughs> and then. Uh, You're gonna get a bill for a session fee after this. That's right. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, there is a science strike going on right now. So I have an assistant clocking my hours right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, that type of performance, we, it has to be done with actors who can do that kind of thing. So, not only is he an amazing actor, he also has an entire. We all do. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so, Nicole, so tell me about one of the craziest things. Deaths? Is that death, what you're death or just story on set that uh, oh most memorable craziness that you remember from doing something in a game? Oh man, I was preparing a death story in my head because I thought that's where we were headed. What, what's what's the best death? Well, I'm gonna do that then. Um, I um, <laughs> um, for those that have played Resident Evil 3, there's a section of the game where Jill can, if you allow it to happen, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> She has a very nasty creature thing go ahead and go straight down her throat and plant eggs in her stomach that then poison her, and then she has to either vomit them up or slowly die from having them injected through her mouth, which is disgusting. And yeah, basically, a mocap and sounds for that was real fun. Real fun. I'll be buying you dinner. <laughs> it's a lot, they're very creative, and then otherwise Death by Fire is just never not fun to right. do. Death by Fire, and then they're like, mmm, this fire's gonna take longer to burn. <laughs> cool, 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 so like, how long are we gonna burn alive? 15, 20 seconds? Maybe 30. From Florida to Burbank, how long the fire are we talking? <laughs> how big is Immediate explosion, what's the situation? Um, so yeah, death by fire, and then death by, I don't even know, someone else can tell me what you would call that kind of death, uh, getting, I don't know, spiders put inside of you. <laughs> oh my god. It's a lot! Well, one of the most, uh, scary deaths, I think, that I've ever had to have an actor do is, uh, one of the, we did all the Tony Hawk games, and then that turned into the Kelly Slater video games, and in those games, you know, you could fall and die, and I think in Kelly Slater, uh, no, actually, uh, sorry, right? Yeah, anyway, you had a death by drowning, right? Which is just about as bad as dying by fire and everything else, right? And if you're gonna go, I don't know, maybe drowning is better than fire. I don't know if there is a good way to go, but... <laughs> it depends uh, on who you are. You know, that's right. Everybody has their own preference. We're the fire by death, water, fire. Who wants to die by fire? Yeah, who wants to die who by fire? Die by yeah, water? right. Show the hands. Fire, water, water. water. Right. Okay, now, who doesn't want to die? die yeah. who, who doesn't want to die at all? <laughs> okay, <laughs> That's my favorite sound right there. <laughs> Just uh, living. So we had, uh, I think it was uh, Amanda Windley. Oh, so this is what. So you, uh, it was not Kelly Sayer. It was, uh, it was snowboard. Uh, what was it? snowboard kids? Not really snowboard kids. You don't die in snowboard kids. Uh, anyway, so Amanda Windley was in, and we had these downhill uh, guys who were skiing, and they had to crash through a uh, lake and drown. And it had to be a quick step. So Amanda, if you guys know her, Amanda is in, what's that? Sean White. Sean White, thank you. Yeah. Sean White. Uh, pro, uh, pro board. Yes. And, uh, and so everyone's coming up with creative deaths. And Amanda's like, oh, I have a good idea. Uh, when I scream like I'm drowning, I'm going to take this bottle of water and I'm going to pour it 
in my mouth while I'm doing this, right? And we're like, great, what could go wrong? <laughs> so she screams, water's going down, and spews all over the microphone, all over the booth. It is one of the best drowning sounds I have ever heard, despite almost destroying a $3,000 microphone. However, <laughs> however, that week I happened to be talking to my friend Elizabeth, who is the marketing director over at Electronic Arts, where I was working, and uh, I was asking her what was going on, and she said, oh, you know, I almost drowned this week. And I said, what? How did you almost drown? And I said, where? And she goes, oh, I was at a cafe. I said, you almost drowned at a cafe? And she said, well, I was just out there drinking a bottle of Pellegrino, and just went down the wrong pipe, just a sip, and usually you cough and it'll, if it goes down, and this time it didn't, and it went into her lungs, and one sip, she was out, and she actually drowned. And okay. there happened Thanks to be- for giving me a new phobia. <laughs> <laughs> and she just happened to be there, a doctor in the cafe, it was right out in San Jose, and they resuscitated her, and it was, Horrific. And here I am, I just did this session with Amanda with Lee, who's been pouring water down her throat. And I'm like, no actor is ever allowed to drink water or scream. I did not know that. So, I... word of the wise, if you're ever cast in a video game to scream, drowning, no, no go there. By the way, this panel is sponsored by Pellegrino. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that I could do this again. drown. I didn't know that I could drown from drinking water. Thank you so much for changing the rest of my life. Yes, so. Or the wife. Okay, Maggie, so you have to have some amazing deaths because... Because <laughs> they always play villains? I feel you, know, you have to have a good you death. You have to kill me. Um, I don't know. I mean, the Lady D death was pretty extreme because it's just a high-piercing scream. So that was super fun to record over and over again. Um, just generally, her, once she transforms, was super fun. Very creaturey, lots of texture. Oh, well, how else have I died? I think I've done it all. I think I've done, I kind of like falling off a cliff and then having to splat at the ground. Um, when you hit the ground, that's kind of fun. <laughs> it's really interesting having to articulate how you die, right? Yeah. To say like, okay, so is the death happening when I hit the ground? Is before the thing hits me, do I scream and then die? How long is the death? Do I collapse and then splat? You don't realize how technical death is until you have to like sound it out and then And then you finally do it. Electrocution, like, that's another really fun one. Electrocution is. <laughs> That's how I do it. <laughs> There's two ways to do electrocution. That's the cartoony way, and then the real way is yeah. just like it, it, your cords get paralyzed. Yes. Like, yeah, that's the real way. Yes. The more gruesome way. Well, no, I was just gonna say the the technicality of of death, like especially if you get like sliced, where you get sliced, and how it affects your vocal cords. If yeah. you'd be able to actually vocalize, you're decapitated. It's not happening. How long do you have to uh, vocalize it before you bleed out? You know, yeah. the, these wonderful things we uh, have to consider when so we do. We're all really happy, positive people. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> so, uh, one of the first games I was working on when I was at Virgin in Electronic Arts, actually just as EA was taking over our company, we had done this game called Thrill Kill. And it was this, it was the first four-player fighter horror game on the PlayStation. And it was this amazing game, and it was just super gruesome. And uh, we actually got banned by the ESRB, we got an adult-only rating. Not because of just the fact that you had people destroying people's heads and ripping people apart. They had a character named Dr. Faustus that would, uh, what would he do? He would bend you over, put his hand through your yeah. rear, and pull out your heart the back way. I mean, it was over the top <laughs> hilarious, right? So, um, good morning. They, they didn't care about that. <laughs> They didn't like the fact that we had all these sound effects that were so gruesome because we were taking like watermelons and ripping them apart and having these actors do stuff. Uh, Valerie was doing the dominatrix uh, in this game and uh, her move was, what did she do? She, she, took, she took like a cattle prod and her character was, she was dressed as like this like very naughty, what was she, like a maid or what was she? Belladonna, right. And, Yeah, so, so the fact was that, so what she did was, it wasn't just that, so she took a cattle prod and she shoved it down your throat and she would explode you from the inside, right? And then she would get up and she would moan and she would do this like thing and she would moan. 
They didn't have a problem with them exploding from the inside. They had the problem with the fact that she would moan and sexually assign that to the character. So the this little guy it. over here is learning a lot of new things. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so that game got, and so when EA was getting a lot of uh, censorship problems, they actually uh, banned the video game, and uh, they shelved it, they never released it. So the team just accidentally let it out to the internet, and it happens to be the largest black market uh, video game that was never released. So not that I'm ever advising anyone, but if you're ever on the internet and exploring the dark web, and hearing about Thrill Kill, uh, it is an awesome game. It was, it was a really fun game, so there you go. Horror at its finest. Okay, so, so, on to, uh, we do want to leave some time. How much time do we have? Do we have to, what time is it? Is it 12 minutes? Mine's not working. Mine's not working either, yes. Uh, it, let, it let me in, though. So we have some time. So we are going to leave some time. So uh, prepare some questions for us, because we're going to leave the last 15 minutes open for some questions from you guys. Um, but I want to ask you guys a couple more questions. So if you guys are preparing for a video game, which is always a fun thing, because there's different types of games, um, how much do you know about a game before you go in? Because a lot of times, you know, on a film, you've got months of preparation, and you get scripts, and you get to memorize lines, and you have all this other stuff. It doesn't always work that way in a video game. So maybe tell us a little bit about the process about uh, working on a video game. What happens when you get cast on a game? Well, when I, when I first started, it was a way longer process. I actually, I lived in uh, San Pedro to start out with, right across, so I'm back home. Hi, guys. And uh, my poor parents, gosh bless them, they, they would uh, be up into the night against their will because I was using the TV to, like, um, research the, uh, the, the past games in the series that uh, before going to uh, the, the current one. But now, um, sides, audition sides, the scripts, they tend to, it depends on the studio, but they tend to say less and less about the project. There's a lot of guesswork, especially around stuff that's like big, so it's like a lot of NBA stuff. Um, so, you know, to, just to get some general buzzwords out of the, um, the descriptions they do give you and then like uh, Google, Google and see which, uh, which video games have, um, we're lucky if we have the studio, the studio or the, the publisher because if it's like an EA game, uh, the, the certain genre of them tend to have the same kind of energy. Uh, for for most games, um, there's a lot of little little things that go into it. I've learned over the years, um, but uh, <laughs> after a while, it just becomes autopilot. Because <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not really given a script to necessarily memorize, yeah. right? So sometimes you walk into a studio and you're like, okay. What are we working on? So I, I've had more and more sessions where like you will get the code name, you send in some voiceover lines, maybe three or four lines, and then they'll be like, "Great, your session's gonna be at uh, two p.m. on Wednesday," and you're like, "Cool, which one was this?" And then you go back and you listen to your four lines, and you're like, "Cool, screw it, no, you'll you'll learn about everything the character when you walk in. It's a four-hour session." And you walk in, and they go, actually, we, I think we want her to be British. And you go, awesome, cool, great, yeah, no problem. Let's do it. Um, and you get like no time with the with the material, and you, you're reading it off of like an Excel or whatever sheet that they're using. If it's a, a, a big open world game or something, you're doing a bunch of characters. Like you'll learn nothing about it. I, I find with the performance capture stuff, we do get scripts in advance, but not always that far in advance, um, because especially in games, like I think even more than film and TV, because the process is so long, because they care so much about the user experience, the story is always changing. Like the scripts change, so we'll go in, we'll shoot two scenes, we'll vaguely have an idea where those scenes might be slotted in, and then we'll come back two months later and be like, actually, we need to die with the wrench instead because they really have to leave with the door. But, like, there's always all these little technical things, and so the scenes will change constantly. So the amount of like scenes that you go in and redo is sometimes surprising. Oh, I was just gonna add on. So what that means as an actor is that your job is really about cultivating your flexibility and your range so that you are always able to adapt to whatever they throw at you in a session. Oftentimes you're walking in blind 
and you have to be able to come up with ideas on the fly. So how can we continue to cultivate that sense of play and that imagination within us and keep that alive when we go into our sessions? You get a lot of, sometimes you get producers or directors or writers who then get inspired by you in the session and they're like, oh, you would be perfect. And then suddenly you're getting new lines and things added in. Uh, what well, we were working on, uh, Saints Row, the writer Steve on this one, would wait until the actors, after they were cast, also doing their first recording session, and then he'd go back and rewrite the script around what the actors were doing. He could hear their speech patterns and how they would perform. That's amazing. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen very often. And it was an amazing process. And it was funny because um, there's an actor, uh, Yuri Lowenthal. Uh, if anyone of you guys know Yuri, he's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 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 So Yuri was working on a project with our vocab stage at PCB, and we had a scene in Saints Row where um, we needed to have a small child come in and just ask the Saints for an autograph. And it had one line, right? And in, with uh, union projects, if you have children, you have to have a set teacher. It's a whole thing, and then you have to. It's just it's difficult to have kids on set doing videos. It's just a challenge. So we were like, well, hey, for this one line, why don't we just bring in Yuri? He's doing another character anyway. Why don't we have him do his little kid voice and have him do something? So he comes onto the vocab stage, and the whole cast is ready to do it. And he just comes up, and he just he says, okay, what voice am I doing? I'm like, just do your like little kid nerd voice thing, right? And so, the, and we had Troy Baker, and we had Arif Kitchen, and I think Michelle Ruff. We had a lot of actors on stage, and all Yuri has to do is just come up and just say, uh, excuse me, can I have your autograph? And he walks up, and we're all wearing the headsets, and he's doing his thing. And he comes up, and he goes, um, 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 and he goes on for like 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, whole cast busts up, and he, and he finally, I, can I get your, and he just whips out this line, and the whole cast busts up. And the writer, Steve, sees this, and he goes, oh my god, I have an idea. And the whole... <laughs> DLC for Jimmy the Nerd that came out on Saints Row was because Yuri improvised that one line and cracked everybody up and they wrote the whole DLC he just the around DLC. Oh, yes. <laughs> that one line. He said, you're giving me a tiny character? I will make it feel <laughs> <hard. laughs> You're lucky if improv makes it in at all. Right. You get the whole DLC, that's like a once in a career. That and when you do a line, when you finally do get the line, whether it's a great line or even a death line or whatever, they're like, great, can you give us two more? Just like that? You're like, okay. And you, that's the thing, in our business, you have to not only be able to get that performance, you gotta be able to repeat it, because it might have a technical problem, it might need to be faster, it might need to be a little bit something different. Can I ask you a question, Keith, on your side of like directing, especially when actors come in on these projects where you're working with 40,000 lines, a gazillion actors. I've found, at least from my side, when you first come in, say you have a couple roles or something, the first 10, 5 even minutes of a session is like, we've got to find the voice. You know, even if we've sent in a tape or whatever else, there's always a like, mm, let's find the voice. Yeah, we call that the dialing in. All right, dialing it in, love that. I find that process from my side always fascinating because for us, we're just like, I don't know, try this. Are we doing good? <laughs> Are we okay? Do you like us? Yeah, you have a number of just say, no, they have no feedback. They don't know. Yeah, you're, you're in a soundproof booth, usually. If you're on stage, it's one thing, because you have other actors or a mocap set, it's a little bit different. It's a really communal environment, but when you're doing a voiceover, you are in a soundproof room, uh, and you cannot hear unless we're turning on the talkback. So you see people on the other side of the glass just going... <laughs> <laughs> you perform this epic line, you give your whole heart and soul, and then crickets. Exactly. <laughs> and then you get a... And yeah, that was good. Moving on. <laughs> and they'll be doing this, and you're like, oh, I screwed up. And then on the other side, it's like, no, I don't want Carl's Jr. today. We haven't to skin anything else. And then it's like, yeah, that was great. There's a lot of self-soothing that happens as an actor. And there's a lot of screaming to a silent box and then just being like, cool, I am enough. <laughs> so your inner demons come out, and so it is. It's really bad because I, you see actors deflate when they because you're all. That's why Zoom was a great thing during COVID, but it was also like the destruction of a lot of the micro communication. Because when you talk to someone, you nod and you say hi, and you make eye contact and that kind of stuff. But you are on Zoom and you have like 20 faces there, all looking into their cameras, looking at you, and there's a delay. So you're like. 
you know, so you do the line, and everyone's like, and sometimes your resting face is not always your most pleasant face. <laughs> so like, and sometimes it comes like just a little too late to do the line, and they're still on the. And you're like, oh, wow. And, and so it's, it's so Zoom was like kind of a, a mixed blessing for us during COVID. But in the booth, it can also be you know a problem if the people on the other side of the glass aren't paying attention to what you're doing because if they are arguing about lunch, uh, it can be a thing. So, but that dialing in process you talk about is so fascinating because it's like we're workshopping. We're like. You, and a lot of actors come in like, oh, I auditioned and I did this part and this is what I'm going to do. And they're like, we love that. We're not doing anything like that. That was from the last game. We just wanted to see what you can do. Now we're going to tell you what your real character is. You're like, I, but I rehearsed and I practiced. And like, nope. <laughs> so you have to be flexible as an actor just to know that it's all about the acting. They talk about, you know, as voice actors, uh, people think, oh, I've got a great voice. I'm going to be a great actor. But the truth is it's all about the acting. We really don't care about the voice. We will find the voice because when you're screaming a soldier in Call of Duty, we don't want you doing some type of effect on your voice because you'll sound like a muppet. You're like, ah, ah, ah. And it's like you got to be you. And if you can't scream in your voice, then you're not going to sound real. So when you're doing horror projects, it's got to be real. And so that's why a lot of times when we're auditioning, and it might only be a few lines, you'll see like, you know, a couple screams on there. You'll see they're like. I want to scream in an audition or whatever, but the thing is that if you do sound like a Muppet while you're auditioning, you're like, ah, great thing, but we really have to do the whole range of emotions. Yeah. So we do like workshopping with a lot of the actors to find the strength of what they can do and then create the character around the actor. And that's how you get the best performance. And there's so much trust in you guys. There's so much trust in our directors because once again, we come in so blind and these are the only people that have any other information about any of the other characters, any of the other performances. Like, we are in full trust of you guys being like, yep, that's in the pocket of what we're doing here today. Well, and what's interesting about us as directors is that uh, we sometimes get the script at the same time as you. Yeah, well, we have to. Yeah, she's like, Thank you for pretending. Pretending the feigned confidence. So good. So what's interesting is, as directors, a lot of times these scripts are coming in super hot because they're so big and it's so much bigger than movies that we're seeing it for the first time. The benefit we know is that we know all the cast, we know what everyone else is saying, and the projects that are the real big ones that, that sometimes have like multiple directors, we just did like Midnight Suns, the new Marvel game, and there was like five directors on that. So I know what I'm doing, if I'm doing like Tony Stark and Spider-Man or whatever, there might be five other directors that might have different styles, so you might have like kind of, you don't know what the other characters are saying. But as a, as a director yourself, when you're managing a project, like when Valerie's doing Persona, for example, um, she knows what every other performance is like. So even if she doesn't know what the script is, or there's new scripts coming in, she knows who you're talking to, what those performances are. So it, when you're working, especially also with celebrities, the same idea is that you're just sort of guiding the ship. You're not trying to teach anyone how to act. Our job is not to say that you guys were obviously the rock stars and brought in to do what you guys do. We're just trying to say, let's all go this way together. And that's what we're trying to do during the performances. We have to kind of look at it, interpret it, and make sure that it's consistent with everyone else. Even if it's a great performance, it just might not fit in with everything else that's there. Um, so let's go ahead. We've got about 15 minutes left. So let's go ahead and uh, prepare some questions. I know that they were going to be floating a microphone around for your questions. I'm sure if you don't have one, I'll just have you stand up and yell at us because we like yeah, to hear you test yell. your Call of Duty vibes. That's right. Uh, so we have one right here. Come on and stand up. Do we have a microphone or? Oh wait, we do have one. Sorry, I didn't give you any, any notice. All right. She's on the way. Uh, hang on a second. Give, hold that question for one more second. So we'll talk about one more thing before she gets that microphone. So um, so last, last question before we open it up to everybody else. Uh, so uh, do you guys have a favorite video game or horror game or horror movie or anything that you guys liked that inspired you? What's your favorite like horror property? <laughs> I like I liked Alan Wake. What? What? Get it? Kevin? Me? Kevin? You? I have a weak ticker. I, I actually can't. <laughs> I, I, I don't hate them. I just can't last that long. Um, I really liked uh, the Alan Wake stuff when it was around. That, that, that was a lot of fun. Plus it came free with my Xbox 360. So <laughs> what, what I had for a second. Um, video games in general, I love the Bethesda stuff. Uh, your Skyrims, your New Vegas, stuff like that. And there's some horror stuff in there, but it's a bit more campy. 
Um, yeah, and I feel like if I don't say Five Nights at Freddy's, someone will kill my life. Five Nights at Freddy's! Yeah. Um, I mean, President Evil, right? Yes! Yeah! <laughs> Shepherd's Club! Hey! Um, that's I, it, that's the yeah, answer. That's, yeah. But was there, was, there, was, there, was there like a movie or anything that kind of like, like it was memorable, like maybe as a 10 years old that you are like... Willy Wonka? Yes! <laughs> What, the tunnels thing? The tunnel song? The tunnels! <laughs> when she turns into a blueberry! That was just time! I had a phobia, I never wanted to chew gum again! <laughs> I, I, I have to say that I also am a little bit lame and don't... How funny is it that we're all... Yeah, yeah I'm like, 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 I'll throw out, like, you know, The Shining, it's amazing. Yes, very nice. You know, so, like, iconic stuff like that, I, obviously, I respect and admire and look up to in cool ways, because film, uh, in that genre, so... Well, that's pretty awesome. This, the interesting thing is about when, when things start to go into VR right now, what's really interesting is that's the closest I think to this generation's experience of cinema because you know movie theaters are struggling right now not just because of COVID but just in general most this generation is such a mobile generation that we're watching things on home theaters we're watching things on our phones on our iPads and we're not going into theaters the same way so a movie like The Shining was designed for a 40 foot screen so it doesn't have the same impact when you watch it on a home theater or anything else like that and when you go to see like when ArcLight was doing their re-releases and you see these long shots that were designed for a 40 foot screen, it just doesn't work on a small medium. So this generation doesn't necessarily always know what that was like, but VR is starting to bring that back. That's why things like Village and other things when they would do VR releases are way more visceral because you can't get away from it. So video games are kind of hoping to bring that back. So we're gonna get to your questions right now. I think we have one right here, and uh, this gentleman right here in the, in the black shirt. Question for Kellen. This is to me. This is one of the coolest game performances I've heard. I wanted to see what your thought process was going into all of this, like the Jekyll and Hyde situation for Sun and Moon. I had to meet in the middle with it for an eclipse recently. I would like to hear a little bit of it. <laughs> um, so Sun and Moon uh, are the daycare attendant. It's a new character in uh, in a newer game, Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, um, and they become a quick fan favorite because they're uh, what the kids call a, a scrunkling. <laughs> um, but they have this, uh, they, you know, they, they have the son's kind of this, it, this, this is an, a good example of how a good script will help create a great character. Um, I forget exactly who wrote it, but, uh, you know, Jay Top and, and Brian Framuth and the, and the guys at Steel Wool did a great job creating this uh, sub-universe for Five Nights at Freddy's. Um, and, you know, it, they, it was, it was, it, it, when you get a picture, it's so easy. They're not going to always give you art, especially if they don't know you. But they gave me art, and I thought, oh, this, this, this guy's got a long nose, so maybe he's just a happy Squidward. Um, and then, yeah, the, the uh, other side of them, it's like, just do, the, they, they said, just do the creepiest thing you can do. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. Um, so that ended up being the two sides of it. Uh, Moon was a bit more chill, like a, like a cat ready to pounce, and Sun was a bit more manic, like a cat running around the room. Um, Eclipse came later in the DLC that just came out, Ruben, um, and uh, they are partway between the two. They're, they are the two halves finally at peace and combined with each other. And I felt like that there would be some relief in finally getting, you know, having inner peace. So he just ended up being kind of this, you know, sweetheart, have a bazarific day. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, that's pretty much how they came about. <laughs> when you record that, are you flipping as you record the lines, or are you recording all of Moon and all of... The They'll they'll have mercy, you know. They they'll let me do sun first, and then and then moon. Um, with, with, make you go insane. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, yeah, sometimes that happens with certain directors. But um, generally, if it's you know, uh, they, they'll trust you. You know, they, they'll say which 
will be less strenuous on your throat. Which would you like to do first? <laughs> Some control over the situation. Um, so usually I choose sun first. If we ever did it again with all three, I'd probably choose eclipse first because there's no rasp at all in that. Oh, now that I think about it, it's kind of got the Ryan Styles Carol Channon thing going. <laughs> when we were, uh, we go for it. Uh, we just, uh, my parents and I would always watch Goose Line as a kid. I think uh, the, that sort of embedded itself into acting choices from then on. It's funny how what you watch as a kid will end up becoming your acting style later. When we were working on the Deadpool video game, uh, they were going to cast three different actors to do the three different voices, this two inner voices and this main voice, and this was before the film came out. And I said, I got an actor who can do all three. And they're like, come on, they're so different. And I'm like, just guy Nolan North, He's on Uncharted and other things. And so uh, Nolan, and he would do that live. He would go between all three voices, and it's just amazing when you have an actor just to be completely unfiltered to do that. So you can let an actor let loose like that. It's yeah, and even, even past that, you're not just switching voices, you're switching like perspectives. You're becoming different people if you're doing it right. So if you can do it that fast, you're, you're a superstar. So we have time for a few more questions. So uh, right here with the camera right there, all the way. Hang on, we got a microphone right there because your gas mask is like really cool. <laughs> Thank you a lot. I'm Simon. I just flew in. I'm exhausted. I'll try and keep it short. Uh, first of all, Keith, I love Call of Duty Ghosts. It's one of my favorite games. I Thank need you. a sequel. Rogue needs to die. I want to kill that wanker. <laughs> yeah, you have to kill one of that, right? Of course. Yeah. I hate him. So I've got a question for Nicole right there. Or oh, Jill Valentine. She's finally back. So Nicole, I've got to sit down finally. It's one of the best movies I've ever seen. People pretty disagree, so I love. We can have negative opinions. So the thing is, it reminds me so much of one of my favourite movies from 1996, The Rock, starring Sean Connery, Nicolas Cage, and Ed Harris. And I love how we've got all the gang together, like for the first time ever. It's like the Avengers Assembly, right? And the thing is, as much as I'm glad, I still like to see Jill in the upcoming game. You know, the problem with Resident Evil is that we have so many protagonists. And I'm glad, I mean, I don't want any of them to die, especially not Jill. Don't kill off anyone else, leave my Jill. And the thing is, now that Jill, Capcom verified this, so I'm not making it up. So they verified that she ages now like Wolverine or wine, take it how you want it. So I'm curious, that opens a lot of doors. So is there like a chance we're going to see Jill in the future games? like in the year 2070, kicking ass and looking badass and young as ever. Love this time travel, Jill Energy. <laughs> she doesn't like it. Can we just like it's shift genre? Should we go full sci-fi next? <laughs> Jill and sci-fi? Um, I mean, I have no idea. I wish I had any control over her. Remember how we know the least? <laughs> <laughs> but instead, when and if I get a script, I would be honored. I absolutely and passionate about her as well. And I did really, to kind of talk about your point, I, I did think it was very special for me to get to kind of approach her early on in her journey in a remake. And then also much, much later after she's been through a lot more and the fact that she doesn't age in the same way because of all of the tests and all everything that she's been through. It was a really fun challenge um, and character challenge for me to look at um, basically a very iconic role that's been portrayed by many other actors throughout time and to look at, okay, we've got her, you know, presently now, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How is that going to show up for her? She's aged, but she doesn't look like she's aged in the same way. So no, she really does just not. approaching kind of the wisdom and how does that change vocally? And I did think about those things of sort of uh, aging her up uh, with the weight of everything that she's been through and still that same desire to keep going and to keep pushing forward and so from a character perspective it, it is absolutely a, a joy to really just dig in there and be like hmm what's going to change how she manifests and one thing that uh, is important to know about our industry is that um, we are under such crazy non-disclosures uh, you know we'll have a game that will be in development for two three eight years and we can't talk about it. So sometimes we do a performance, we do something, and then don't know if the game has even shipped. It was it canceled? I've had, I think I've had 50 plus games that have been canceled over the years. I was working on Clive Barker's Ectosphere, which is one of the coolest games ever. We were like four years in, I don't know, $10 million in, 
Never made it out. It's amazing. I, I just did uh, Remnant 2, Remnant from the Ashes 2 just released. I worked on that before COVID. I thought that was not coming out. But <laughs> then it just came out of nowhere. <laughs> I'm yes. like, oh, okay. So a lot of times the actors are like, so uh, what, are you going to be back? And and there was one actress, unfortunately, uh, where they're, they saw a picture of her in the studio and took a selfie and they're like, oh, are you working on this game? And she didn't say yes, and she didn't say no. She just said, like, a maybe with a smiley face or whatever. Team came in, fired her, took her names off the credits, and she was out of the whole series. And so we're under really, really strict NDAs. So as much as we want to tell you, and sometimes we really want to tell you we're working on a big game, and it is awesome, and we're just, like, not allowed to. Yeah, boothies can be dangerous, unfortunately. Yes. Um, so we have a couple, couple more questions right here, right here in the front. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, I hope you don't mind a slightly more contentious question, but I did want to pick your brains about this. What does um, contentious mean again? <laughs> uh, controversial. Um, so in terms of like AI, I know that there's a lot of like, and kind of take your voices and they use them in various projects, usually in just funny, memey ways. But I do know that there's like concerns about like how that can be implemented in technology, and especially in the realm of video games where technology is all a part of it. Like. What is your opinion about that? And like, are you are there good things about it or bad things? Like, yeah. So this is a very loaded conversation. <laughs> this is our next panel. If you guys are here for the next hour, so, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna hand this over to you guys what you guys think about it. But I'm gonna give my perspective first because it's no, kind of it. kind of an overall thing because we've been dealing with this for quite a long time. Um, AI is a tool. And we have been using it on all of our enemies and everything in games. Everything is AI generated. We've been using it for many, 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 many years. The idea is when you're talking about generative AI and actually using it to replace things and, and supplanting the creative, replacing voices, replacing writing, replacing the creative process, something that should be done by a human should stay being done by a human. AI is a tool, and if we can use it in the right way responsibly, it's amazing. But if we use it to replace things and suddenly get to a point where it's just cheaper and cheaper and cheaper ways to do this, our translation teams, we work with a tremendous amount of international titles, right? I mean, Resident Evil, a lot of our titles that we worked on that we just did, they're all international titles working with us in the US and going back and forth. A lot of the localization and other things, our localizers are coming to us saying, hey, by next year we're not going to be here. It's all AI going to be driven. And it's like, well, a play on words in Japanese is not going to work in English through an AI. They're not going to understand why that, that's there, why an actor makes a choice to go this way versus this way. The, we, the reason we want actors working together is because of that interaction. And no matter how much you teach an AI, and we've been working on things for years and realizing the implication of this and working with the unions behind the scenes and other things, this is a really a, a very important time for us because there are going to be companies who will turn to AI and just say, hey, this is a cheap way, a cheap way, a cheap way to get things out. And for a while, the audiences will be like, oh, it's okay. It's interesting. Oh, look at this. And there are some things that are amazing about it, and it'll be kind of an interesting thing. And then suddenly it will go back and people will say, what is this? And it's going to be all created without AI or with AI as a tool. And that's where the real creativity is going to come back. So it will go through peaks and valleys. You just said there was an improv that inspired a DLC. Exactly. Like that's human creativity. That's a lot of uh, amazing income that that company made by getting to jump off of some really talented creatives. So there's value there. So, um, and I did want to have you guys answer this, but I, I do want to get one more question in. Um, yeah. It is a very important question, and we will have a whole panel on that. Some actors are really, you're going to see a lot of stuff happening, not just with the unions, and well, obviously what's happening in, in the, the strikes that are going on. Sometimes things get bloated one way or the other, but the truth is, is that um, we will find some balance in our industry. It's just, it's not going to be black and white. Let me get one more question in here. A uh, woman over here with the white and the vest, yes? Right there, right there, yes. Um, what horror game have you worked on? Would you want to be like part of a Halloween haunt, like a maze or a street? <laughs> huh. This is really challenging for me. You know, Dead Space no. might be fun. Maggie? Maggie, I mean. Yeah, I don't know, haunted 
haunted castle to be pressed would be pretty cool. Yes. Lucky, I would, I mean, obviously I'd love to do a jumping, but I, I would love to do a haunted castle to be pressed. A haunted piano in the opera room? The noises come out and sing a little song and dance a little ditty? <laughs> so it's turning into a derby haunted house. <laughs> Now, are you guys all signing here today? Are you yeah, guys have... yeah. oh, Okay, so um, after the panel, uh, what time are you signing today? Is it throughout the day or certain hours? Do you guys know? Just uh, there until the show ends, I think. So yeah, we're come, yeah. come find these amazing people here, talk to them, ask them. Look for my banner. <laughs> she doesn't have a banner, right. so look for the person next to my banner. Yeah, we're, we're, all, right. Right. <laughs> we're, we're all in a row of three. Yeah. yeah, we're all right next to each other, and you can come ask us questions too if you didn't get your question answered. We're around. Yeah! Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning.